We have our quorum. There we go. Okay, good morning, everybody. This is the Sacramento Area Council of Governments Policy and Innovation Committee for Monday, May 9th. It is now 10 a.m. and I'm gonna call the meeting to order. Um, if our clerk will please provide the basic instructions for our meeting. All right, good morning. This meeting is being recorded and streamed over the internet. For members of the public viewing this meeting online, we accept and encourage public comment and have provided options that are listed at the top of this meeting agenda. For our staff and committee members attending in person today, SACOG has installed cameras in our boardroom, so you are on camera and visible to parties viewing this meeting online. You are sharing microphones. Please do not pick up or move the table mics that are in front of you. You can speak at a normal volume and the mics will transmit the audio through Zoom. Red dot means you are muted. Green means you are live. Please do not access Zoom through your laptop device. Since you're here in person, there's no need for that. Doing so would cause microphone feedback. For our committee members participating online, thank you for joining us today. Please mute your devices when you are not speaking and use the raise hand feature in Zoom should you wish to comment. Fantastic. If everybody will please uh, stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Mr. Clerk, will we please call the roll? All right, directors, when I call your name, please indicate your presence. Director Bernasconi. Here. Burris. Absent. Frerichs. I am here. Stollard. Absent. Vice Chair Middleton? Here. Vice Chair Thomas? Here. And Chair Kozlowski? Here. We have a quorum. Excellent. Okay. Um, public communications is first. So if there's anybody attending the meeting who would like to comment on items that are not on the agenda, now would be the appropriate time. There's no public comment. Fantastic. Okay. Um, well, then we'll take up the consent calendar. Anybody like to discuss any of this, or I will entertain a motion. Thomas, move approval of the consent calendar. Second, Ferrix. We have a motion and a second. Would you please call the roll? Okay, directors, when I call your name, please indicate your vote. Director Bernasconi? Yes. Burris? Absent. Ferrix? Yes. Stollard? Absent. Vice Chair Middleton? Yes. Vice Chair Thomas? Yes. And Chair Kozlowski? Yes. Motion carries. Excellent. And will you uh, please read the first action item for us? Okay, we are on to action item, item number three, Community Voices Committee, presented by Rosie Ramos. All right, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Rosie Ramos here, uh, and I'm here today to discuss this creation of a brand new committee for SACOG called the Community Voices Committee. Uh, so I want to start off by saying I think we're in a really exciting time for SACOG at the moment with a lot of new projects that are poised to have really great impacts in our region, like Green Means Go, Engage, Empower, Implement, the Blueprint, and our overall race, equity, and inclusion work. And as we have seen working on these programs in the last couple of years in some capacity, it has really come up that in order to do the best work that we can do to improve the quality of life of all residents in our region, we really have to come back to the basics and connect with community priorities and needs. Uh, best practices all around advocate for community perspectives and priorities to be embedded in the government decision making uh, at all phases of the project and planning processes. And so as a regional entity, the role of direct community involvement and engagement, of course, rests with our local jurisdictions, but does not remove the responsibility to incorporate those perspectives into our work. Uh, in fact, we've had a great example of what can be done when we work with more hands-on with the community-based organizations and the local jurisdictions when we did the outreach uh, for the Trails Network uh, last year that resulted in over 3,000 respondents across the region and the successful levels of engagement smart started with the connection uh, with local and trusted community-based organizations and nonprofits, many of which were referred to by the SACOG board. And so based on this successful approach with the CBO collaborations and the new opportunities that we have through all the programs that I just mentioned, we recognize that we need more a more sustained approach for the CBO involvement in the work that we do. So today I'm here to ask that this committee recommend to the board that we establish this new Community Voices Committee. Uh, this will be a place for staff to hear from community representatives and bring their perspectives into the work that SACOP does. It will be a space for collaboration. 
Uh, we intend that the committee would have up to 12 people from across the region that represent different communities that have been traditionally left out of our planning processes, including not limited to uh, Black, Indigenous, Asian, Pacific Islander, Hispanic, Latine, low income, disabled, immigrant, youth, LGBTQ plus community um, and seniors. And they will be asked to weigh in on different topics from engaging them on how to advance racial and social justice efforts within projects and programs to creating outreach strategies and everything in between. Uh, the members in the committee would be invited to join us for two years and be paid the traditional committee compensation of $100 per meeting. Uh, the intent is that they would meet quarterly, but we would augment the communication between them and us with um, newsletters or engagement surveys or other methods as needed. And while the official members would be 12, we would also share the committee information with any and all CBOs that would be interested in coordinating and working with SACOG. So this really is a, a, a an effort for us to be more collaborative with the CBOs to have a more sustained and ongoing relationship with them. Um, because as we've seen in the last couple of years, when we try to do outreach um, with them and they haven't heard from us in a while, it's a little bit more difficult to stand up working groups and such. So having something that's more stable allows us to have better and stronger relationships with them. And we do have need for outreach and engagement. It's uh, more easily created and, um, and more collaborative and more um, fruitful in the end. So. I'll stop there. I'm happy to take any questions or discuss any of the items that are in the charge that was included with the staff report. Well, I guess I will ask the dumb question then, Rosie. How do you how does someone rise to the level of uh, deserving a spot on this special council? Not a dumb question at all. Um, I think we're going to work with, uh, we're going to request that some of our board members, right, give us more recommendations. We're building off of the list that we've had in the past. And so we'll um, try to make a call out and see. We want regional representation, of course, from the, from the six counties. So that's going to be a really important one. Um, but then also starting with folks that are able and capable to attend the committees is going to be another thing because we do know that CBOs are at capacity. So there's that component that will play into it. Um, but collaborative working with, um, with our board members and seeing which communities um, or which, sorry, CBOs um, are able to engage in recommendations from your part that you think are good community representatives. Uh, we'll also work with our REI working group. I mean, we already have a great relationship there with folks and so their recommendation will be very important as well. So these are all gonna be people who have a stake in communities of interest. Mm -hmm. So do they necessarily need to have some background or direct interest in transportation or transportation funding? Um, I would say not necessarily, no. I think what we wanna know is the priorities at the community broadly, right? That, that it's not just related to transportation, but that so many things do touch on transportation. Um, we want a broad variety of folks that have different expertise levels. And so um, I think it's gonna be a mix. Right. Any other questions from uh, board members or? committee members? Looks like Director Thomas has her hand up. Oh, please, yes. Director Thomas. Thank you so much. Good morning. Um, thank you, Rosie, for, for the explanation and bringing this to us. Um, I think in, um, you, you said that it's important to get re representation from across the six county region. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I agree that uh, being a, a regional board and this, we need to tackle, tackle this regionally. I think my recommendation would be under the membership um, where we talk about that um, regional representation of communities that are typically let out, including but not limited to, and then we we list you know the different different groups. Mm -hmm. I might add um, seniors, immigrants, um, and and rural have a rural component in there, and I think that would invite the rural voices in our region to the table, which will have I think um, you know a unique perspective that can help mm -hmm. um, broaden thought onto where we need to go. That, that would just be my recommendation on this. Excellent. Yeah, that's a great recommendation. Thank you. Directors, any other questions or comments? Okay, any public comment? Uh, there's no public comment. All right, well then uh, we are looking to uh, give the staff the go ahead with this work plan. Um, so I'm, I'll entertain a motion if there's one. I'm happy to make a motion and uh, also incorporating uh, Director Thomas's uh, 
sort of suggested a, a technically amendment or <laughs> amendments into a, into the motion as well. Thomas second. <laughs> okay, we have a motion from Director Ferrix and a second from Director Thomas. Will you please call the roll? All right, directors, when I call your name, please indicate your vote. Director Bernasconi? Yes. Burris? Absent. Ferrix? Yes. Stollard? Absent. Vice Chair Middleton? Yes. Vice Chair Thomas? Yes. And Chair Kozlowski? Yes. Motion carries. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Action item number four. Okay, item number four is request for proposals for state advocacy and lobbying services by Sabrina Bradbury. Good morning, Chair and committee members. The item before you is a staff recommendation that the committee recommend that the board uh, authorize the release of a request for proposals for state uh, advocacy and policy services and delegate authority to the executive director to negotiate a contract and select a consultant. Our current scope of work for these services has been focused on securing funding for Green Means Go. And while this is still a priority, we're also looking to more comprehensive services that go beyond uh, just advocating for funding as we enter the next phase of Green Means Go implementation. So the current contract goes through the end of this calendar year. And with this expanded scope and to align with the legislative calendar, we think the timing is right to release a request for proposals. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, directors, any questions? This may be the most straightforward item that we've had on the agenda at SACOG in a while. So not much controversy to this. It's always a good idea to um, refresh and learn who's available to provide services, notwithstanding the fact that what we've got so far has been excellent on the Green Means Go. So. All right, any public comment? Uh, no public comment. Fantastic, all right. Well, I will entertain a motion then as well. I do have a quick comment, Mr. Chair. Sure. Yeah, I think, I mean, you made a, I think a similar comment, but I do think that, you know, so it, sure, it's always good to sort of, uh, you know, check and see what's out there. Um, but I would say, I would suggest that um, the current uh, services that are being provided, both frankly at the state level and at the federal level have been really great um, from, it's a technical term, uh, <laughs> from the current firms that we employ for, for both the local and state and federal uh, advocacy work. Uh, and so, you know, understood that there's this need for, you know, sort of always checking, you know, in, I think it's a very good thing for us to do that and sort of have a, uh, you know, see who's out there and what services and how competitive folks can be. But I just would like to really recognize the current work that's been done. Uh, and I think that uh, we've been well served by both firms. Thank you. Lucas is 100% accurate. So are you moving the item also? Absolutely, happy to do that. Fantastic, I'll be the second. Please call the roll. All right, directors, when I call your name, please indicate your vote. Director Bernasconi. Yes. Uh, Burris. I'm staying. I'm staying. Uh, Ferrix. Yes. Stollard. Absent. Vice Chair Middleton. Yes. Vice Chair Thomas. Yes. And Chair Kozlowski. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, item number five. Item five is approved final budget and overall work program for fiscal year 2022-2023 presented by Loretta Sue. Good morning. Just give me one second. Let me share my screen here. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Let me just start here. Okay. Give me one second, sorry about that. Not quite working here yet. So I have too many screen going at one here. Let me just make sure I'm grabbing the right one over. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so um, so SICOG as a um, federal designated metropolitan planning organization is required to develop an overall work program and budget annually. 
Um, in April, the board um, review and release the, uh, the draft OWP and budgets. So this morning here that the board um, staff is seeking board recommendations to review and adopt the final budgets for fiscal year 2021-22. I'm sorry, just wanna make sure. Yeah, no, Loretta, can you hit I'm present? Sorry. Can you hit present mode, please? And okay, it'll, it'll, I'm sorry. it'll fill the screen better. Thought I did that. Apologize. Uh, let's see. Upper left or lower right. Okay. My apology. I'm having two screen and I didn't know which one. I thought I started off. So you can't see my screen here. No, we can see the full PowerPoint's uh, desktop. Oh, okay. My apologies here. Let me just move this over. Sorry about that. Okay. Can you see? Lara, can you see I it go, now? There I go helping. <laughs> okay. Loretta, we have it? a we. It's a, it's very zoomed in. We have Jessica in in room that can share your screen. And if you just want to let her know when the next slide is, we can we can go ahead and share. Your oh, okay. The only thing is, sorry. The only thing is that I have the um kind of animated. So let me try it again. And my apologies. Let's see here. Okay. Let's do this. Okay. Hey. There it is. There it is. Okay. Yeah, it. Okay. Sorry for a little bit of a mix up here. So I apologize for that. So, yeah. So I just uh, noted that the board reviewed the draft budgets um, at the April board meeting. So, here's just a quick timeline of um, the development of the budget and OWP. So, a, cop, a draft budget was submitted to Caltrans and federal agencies for review and comment back in March. And then at the board, um, the board review and release the, um, the draft budget for public comments at the April board meeting. So at the May board meeting, uh, staff is recommending that the board take actions to adopt the final budget and OWP for the fiscal year 2021-22. So here's just a quick um, highlights of the budgets. At discuss at the April board meeting, SACOG as a MPO received many types of fundings from the federal and state governments for the Sacramento regions. However, not all of the fundings flow through SACOG budgets, and most of them are passed through directly to member agency and to the to the regions, like the money for the funding rounds and all the various type of um, transit fundings. So um, the action for, um, for board to take is the two budgets that SACOG managed. The first one is the SACOG operation budgets. This budget's including all the work activities and projects that advance the SACOG three-year work plan. And then, so some of these projects include race, equities, inclusions and initiative, mileage-based pricing pilots, next generation initiative, initiative and then also mainly the the rip housing program and then also the bring means go some of the fuse projects that is included in the state cog OWP for fiscal year 2022-23. Um, fortunately with the increase in some of the fundings the budgets um, balance current revenue with the expenditure so there is no use of fund balance for the fiscal year. And it also includes over $20 million of funding for the region, for the regions. And the second budget is the board and advocacy budgets. This budget includes um, board activities, advocacy work, and then also staff support and assistance for member agencies. Some of the key changes from the draft to the final budgets includes um, reflected a total of $1.3 million increase in revenue. And this is mainly related to the SIGCARC operation budgets. Um, we were recently awarded two discretionary grants from the Caltrans um, Sustainable Communities Grant Award. And then um, there's no changes to the sport and advocacy budgets. There is a 496,000 increase in the safe budgets this budget is being approved by the SAFE board, but because SACOC has managed um, this contract with SAFE to provide the services, so it is included in SACOC OWP documents. 
This final budget also reflected comments from Caltrans, federal agency, and then local partners. Um, there's no fiscal impact to the budget that were presented to the board in April. They were just minor updates to the OWP documents. Here's a quick overview of the uh, SACOC operation budget revenues. Total revenues is $39.5 million, an increase of 862,000, or, um, and then also an increase compared to the previous um, fiscal year. The federal um, revenue makes up about 27% of the total revenues. And then state is about 54%. And as I noted earlier, this is mainly related to the WEEP um, housing program and also the Green Means Go. And locals and other revenue makes up the remaining 19% of the revenues. And then here's another overview of the revenue by activities. Total revenues of 38.7 million, an increase of 1.2 million comparing to um, the draft budget just by categories here. Um, the core planning activity is it's 14.5 million of the total revenue for the year. And then regional revenues is 21.2 million comparing to 5.6 million in the fiscal year 21-22. Um, again, the main increase is mainly related to the Green Means Go and then also the REAP um, housing programs. There's an um, overview of the expenditures by category. Total expenditure for the fiscal year is 39.5 million comparing to 20.7 million from last fiscal year. And here's the breakdown of the expenditures by categories. The past due costs and consulting costs makes up 61% of the total budgets. Same thing, it's just related to the REAP and Green Means Go program. Staff costs is 26%. It's had an increase of approximately 1.7 million compared to last fiscal year. And the increase is mainly related to the, um, the new MOU that was approved by the board in March. Um, the, um, the, the increase will be resulted in saving from future years um, of the MOU. And then for the board and advocacy budgets, total is 1.1 million. There's no changes um, compared to the draft budgets. It's about 107,000 increase compared to last fiscal year. And let's see, staff costs for um, Advocacy and technical support to member agency is 46%. Board expenses is 8% and advocacy work is 35% and partnership is 11%. For more information, please refer to attachment H, which has the breakdown of the uh, total budgets for the board and advocacy. The next step. Staff is asking the policy and innovation committees recommending to the board to adopt the final budgets for the um, an OWP at the May board meeting. With that, staff will submit the adopted budget and OWP to Caltrans and federal agencies for approval for expenditures of fund effective July 1st, 2022. With that, um, um, this, present, this concluded the presentation of the budgets Happy to answer any questions. Okay, directors, um, any questions that you have for Ms. Sue? I do have a quick question. Go yes. ahead, Director Thomas. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, Loretta. Can you refresh my memory? Just what the the partner eleven percent partnership entails? What what is that expense item? I don't. Um, the partnership. Let me just go back to that screen there. Let's see. So, the partnership. Are you referring to the board and advocacy budgets, right? Yes. 
Okay. Thank you. So um, partnership shifts, those are in mainly including like um, what we budgeted for, like the cap to cap trips, you know, some of the, um, you know, board, um, you know, uh, site visits and, and some of the work, like if we are going to have a in, um, an offsite that could be also include the future forum that like we have in the previous year. Okay, great. I just, yeah. I just didn't understand the term and how it relates to board advocacy. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, directors, anybody else like to put a question on the table? All right, any public comment? There's no public comment. Okay. Loretta, thank you very much. Um, directors, I will entertain a motion to push, put the final budget forward to the main SACOG board. So moved, Bernasconi. Second, Middleton. Okay, we have a motion by Bernasconi and a second, second by Middleton. We please call the roll. All right, directors, when I call your name, please indicate your vote. Director Bernasconi? Yes. Burris? Yes. Frerichs? Yes. Stollard? Absent? Vice Chair Middleton? Yes. Vice Chair Thomas? I, yes. And Chair Kozlowski? Yes. Motion carries. All right, fantastic. We're on to our information items, item six. Uh, item six is the Mega Region Working Group Meeting Summary presented by Clint Holton. Good morning. Um, just a brief update today um, for those of you that were not part of our mega region working group. So we had the second meeting um, of this year for the mega region working group for just quick reminder, that group is um, a working group made up of four electeds um, plus uh, supported by staff from the Metropolitan Transportation Commission in the Bay Area, and then San Joaquin Council of Governments in San Joaquin County, and then SACOG. And uh, we had our second meeting of the year um, on April 22nd. That meeting really focused on um, pricing, transportation pricing, roadway pricing. Um, it, we led off with two presentations. And in your packet, you'll see all of the presentations and the staff reports that were presented there. Two presentations, one by um, Pat Jones of the International Bridge, Tunnel, and Turnpike Association. And he was talking a little bit about kind of the state of transportation facility pricing, primarily tolling throughout the country, um, throughout um, the United States. Um, he focused a lot on technology, on operations, on how these things work and some of the reasons behind, um, behind their existence. Um, and then we also had a presentation following Pat from Jeannie Ward-Waller um, with Caltrans headquarters on just kind of the state perspective on, on pricing. Um, uh, an acknowledgement that pricing is part of the California transportation plan. They acknowledge that it exists in plans throughout the region, that there's local pricing, that there's a need for the state to partner. She talked a little bit about the statewide um, working group on pricing. Um, it's made up of many MPOs. Um, SACOG is one of them. Following that meeting, I think we're also adding the Yolo County Transportation um, District to that, um, or management district to that working group. That was one of the the immediate actions out of that, that meeting. Um, and then Jeannie talked a little bit more about the state's um, interest in ensuring equitable pricing and being a good partner to regions, um, as well as not just looking at tolling, but looking at all the forms of pricing that are now making up um, an important strategy in um, long range transportation plans, sustainable community strategies around the, the state. Um, MTC, followed up with just kind of an overview presentation of the pricing efforts or the, the, the role that pricing strategies play in each of our regions. Um, I think it's obvious the Bay Area is the furthest along with a network of, I think, around 130 or so lane miles of priced toll lanes um, in their region. They're looking at a full build out of over 700 miles eventually. Um, we don't have anything yet in the Sacramento region. Um, we are looking at, at both uh, kind of expressways. The, the I-80 causeway is one of the near-term examples of a place that, that something like that is being looked at. Um, we're also looking at mileage-based pricing, uh, kind of a replacement for the fuel tax, not an add-on to the fuel tax, but mileage-based pricing that can vary by time of day, can respond to demand, um, 
it can it can react to different roadway conditions. Those are those are two strategies that we have in our plan, both facility based and mileage based pricing. And then San Joaquin is um, is currently looking at potential pricing um, or at least a pricing alternative on the um, 205 connecting into the Bay Area between um, uh, I-5 and 80. Um, so that those were really the the focus of the of the full meeting is kind of exploring where we're at in pricing. All of us include pricing as part of our sustainable community strategies, but we're in very different places in terms of um, implementing. One of SACOG's first steps on, on pricing is um, uh, look, doing a pilot study that, or developing actually a, a framework for a pilot study that would look at how pricing um, can further equity goals or interacts with equity goals, um, what its implications could, would be, um, trying to kind of really understand what the implications of pricing would be um, in our region and how we could use it as a tool. Um, the, the price, while pricing was the main subject of the full meeting, we kind of got squeezed at the very end, but we were also brought forth, and it is in your packet, some of the collateral materials that MTC developed around the mega region dozen priority projects. Um, the, those are now available. I think we may have used some of that in some of our cap to cap work, but um, those are now available for, for all of us to use um, uh, in any of our advocacy work or discussions with partners. Um, we also have a now a, um, a letter of support template. So as projects are going through that are um, either part of that mega region set of priorities, we have a process now by which the mega region working group can endorse um, those projects for grant applications, things like that. Um, that's kind of the, the high level overview of what was discussed at the meeting. I wanna make sure I left a little time for um, either um, Directors Kozlowski or Director Ferrix. Um, you were both there. If you had any impressions that were worth, worth sharing with the group. I'm also happy to, if you, in scanning the, the packet or the materi materials, see if I can answer any, any questions or, or comments. Lucas, anything particular you'd like to add to that? I think he captured the high points. Yeah, th thanks, Clint, and thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I think uh, just two quick points. One, uh, first of all, <laughs> who would have imagined there's an international bridge and tolling, uh, uh, you know, association? <laughs> uh, but there is, and he was a great speaker, and it, I learned more about the issues around managed lanes and tolling uh, than I had, you know, I, mean, I knew some, but I learned so much from that presentation. So, um, actually, probably wouldn't be the worst for us to have a future board. Uh, sort of workshop on that sort of topic at some point, um, since there is some more of this sort of planned in the in the region. Um, so anyway, but yeah, fantastic um, presentation there. And then the second point, though, would be just, um, well, I do think there is a lot, you know, this is all, all really good progress for us sort of starting to think regionally and work together throughout the sort of the, the larger um, uh, cohort of MPOs. I think it's important that we, um, uh, you know, I'm worried that it that that's maybe not not where it stops, but I think that there's really a need for a sort of coordinated legislative effort on some of these items as well. Because while we have this list of projects um, that sort of are, we'll say, endorsed by the three you know MPOs, and it span the sort of three uh, um, uh, sort of regions, I think you know we a number of us were back in Washington D.C. this last week for Cap to Cap. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, while we were sort of highlighting very much so the sort of the, this dozen projects throughout the region and talking about sp some specific ones in SACOG, the SACOG territory, I'm a little worried that, you know, that there still may be uh, other, some of the other MPOs, whether it's MTC or San Joaquin COG, may actually be sort of just uh, only really emphasizing their, pro their particular projects. And so I think that they're, you know, we just need to, I think, make sure that there's, uh, you know, it's one thing for us to sort of get together and talk about planning, and, and I think there's been a lot of progress made again, but I do think that we, I think, need to all be sort of singing off the same song sheet, so to speak, um, if we're going to sort of try to move some of these projects forward uh, in the years to come. In light of that comment, I was just wondering, James, if you could comment the, the like, original mega region of like New York to Washington, D.C., and their transportation challenges. 
how, mm-hmm. how have they bridged those gaps in terms of working together? And I'm, I'm only asking because you guys were just in Washington, but I know you have some experience on the East Coast. And I'm just curious. Yeah, well, um, that's a great question. So, so um, a lot of the mega region work when I was back in DC over a decade ago was, uh, I would say revived by a group called America 2050, uh, actually, which was ha- housed out of the Regional Plan Association, RPA, which is a really great, actually, sort of civic group around infrastructure and planning in the greater New York region. I promise not to give you a lecture on this. I know you didn't ask me that. Um, I asked. <laughs> well, well, I will say, I think that the Northeast and that quarter really from DC to Boston uh, because honestly, the states are so small and the inter, right, the interstate travel and economy was so important that they had no kind of choice. Uh, um, but but to begin to collaborate, you know, boy, as far back, right, as the 70s and 80s, um, I'm not saying it's perfect. Uh, 70s, whatsoever. 70s, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. Um, but I actually think that. Um, that one of the um, one of the more interesting mega region efforts. So so you know, look, they've they've got they've got Amtrak, they've got the Northeast Corridor, they've got a I ninety five uh, kind of coalition that works on a lot of goods movement stuff. I mean, I ninety five is a if you want to see our potential future, just go sit on I ninety five on any any day of the year between uh, DC and Boston. It's just it's horrible. Um, but uh, actually, D.C., so Baltimore, D.C., Richmond, Virginia, I think has now emerged as I think what we should probably uh, mimic and look to as what we're trying to do here, which is uh, very driven by civic and business community, um, you know, across state lines, I think even down in North Carolina. Uh, and they've done a lot of work with their rail and commuter rail and Amtrak and tolling. Um, and there's a guy actually who uh, is now in contract with us, who used to be the deputy secretary in Virginia, Nick Donahue, who can tell us a lot about that. So I know that's a longer answer than you wanted because, uh, uh, but there's a, there's about 10 mega, mega region quarters that have been identified in the last 15 years. You know, we're one of them, Southern California, um, you know, Midwest, um, Southeast, you know, uh, Pacific Northwest, the ones that you might imagine, right? The Denver and sort of uh, down to Albuquerque. Um, and I think it's a great question in terms of who's doing what, but I will tell you, I think that, again, that Baltimore, DC, Virginia, North Carolina quarter is a good one for us to emulate in terms of what Lucas just said, which is advocacy, uh, really, really pushing projects, really getting things done. I've been very impressed. Well, maybe we can make that one a little bit of a study project going forward. I, I, I think that's excellent. Um, yeah, and, and it was funny having that conversation about toll, toll roads particularly and just reflecting on the fact that those have been with us as long as there's been human civilization and gas taxes are actually the strange innovation that's happened in the last 70 years. So going back, we're, we're going back to the future in some ways. Excellent. Uh, directors, any other questions, comments, curiosity about this topic? The uh, presentations have been superb at each one of those mega region meetings. So I'd encourage any of you that may have any interest at all to, to join us to, as a fly on the wall for those. And a reminder that um, our, the vice chair this week or the, this year of the mega region working group is Director Gore. Um, so SACOG has the vice chair seat, which will become the chair again. Um, this effort really having been revived by Director Ferrix back in 2020. So we have the chair next year. Um, I'd also just say, and I, I definitely agree, uh, Dr. Ferks, and I talked a little bit about what his comment was earlier. That said, I would also say for those on cap to cap on the transportation team, this effort was is one of the most compelling things that we can put in front of our delegation. They ask lots of questions, they get engaged, they're, you know, they're sort of amazed by the fact that we're working beyond our borders when the work within our borders is actually quite challenging and complex to begin with. So <clears throat> I would say, um, as we, you know, as we, as we work with our congressional delegation, as we go back to DC, perhaps on individual trips or city or county trips or whatever trips you go on, carrying that little 
um, fact sheet, you know, four pager. It would be it would be wonderful if you could all do that. Sanding. Okay. Or any questions from the public? Uh, no public comment. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Clint. Appreciate that presentation. Um, yeah. Let's move on to item number seven. Item seven is the advocacy update presented by Sabrina Bradbury. All right, good morning again, committee members. Let me just pull up my PowerPoint presentation here. Okay, so I have a few updates on state and federal legislative activities for you today. Um, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing on federal grant coordination. And then I'll touch on our state budget advocacy and I'll spend the bulk of the time talking about SB 375 related discussions and legislation, um, a few reports that are spurring a lot of discussion on this topic. So first on grant coordination, as you may recall, we have many different competitive grant programs that are rolling out from the bipartisan infrastructure bill. And uh, it is spurring a lot of activity around coordination. Uh, we've heard from the Department of Transportation and Federal Highway Administration that they are looking to MPOs to serve as in a role of assisting with vetting projects and prioritizing uh, grant applications. They are concerned about getting flooded with applications. And so really looking for regional applications to the extent that that makes sense. And um, we're doing a few things to help with technical assistance and coordination on that front. First, we've been holding a few um, cons consultation sessions with our federal lobbyist consultants who are expert in what these grant programs are. We had 10 of those consultations uh, about a week and a half ago where we had member jurisdictions and partner agencies for 30 minute time slots. They brought some project ideas and then our consultants advised them on which grant programs might be a good fit for their projects. The consultants also gave advice on the types of projects that DOT is going to be looking for, projects that focus on equity, VMT reduction, bike and pedestrian safety, and workforce transportation. So the to the extent that applications can touch on more than one of those priorities and ideally all of them, they will be much more competitive. Uh, member staff expressed appreciation. They seem to really value the sessions. We have more happening tomorrow and Friday of this week. So we'll um, be sure to share information out from all of those and hope to do a lot of uh, matchmaking and grant coordination to see where there might be multiple jurisdictions that are wanting to go after funding for similar types of projects and when it makes sense to do a, a regional effort. We are also developing a process for members and partners to request letters of support for their applications from SACOG and technical assistance. So we'll be rolling that out in the next few weeks, just trying to get a, a little more organized and streamlined uh, in how members and partners can be making those requests. And then we will also be communicating out the notice of funding opportunities as they come out. There's a handful over just the next couple of months and they'll continue to, to post more grant programs throughout the year. So we wanna make sure everyone knows about those and encourage them to come talk to us so that uh, we can coordinate and provide assistance. And then I just wanted to touch briefly on our state budget advocacy efforts. Attachment A in the committee item is a copy of our joint letter that is with some environmental organizations and infill, development, infill developers. So it's a big coalition requesting a $5 billion increase to the infill infrastructure program, but in a separate pot under that program that's reimagined to uh, provide additional funding for upfront investments in low VMT areas. So all the green means go implementation that we've been talking about for sewer and utility upgrades to really prepare an area for infill development. 
And we're also advocating that this be done as a proportional allocations to regions. So the HCD would still manage the program, but each region would have a proportional amount of funding that they would be competing for instead of having a statewide competition for this $5 billion. It'd be similar to what we did with uh, what we saw with the REAP funding, how it had regional per, uh, geographic proportional allocations. And our lobbyists are meeting with the administration and legislators on this. We have sent trailer bill language over to the Department of Finance. They requested that from us. And we also shared it with the governor's office and other legislators of, as they've expressed interest. So we will keep you posted on how that effort uh, continues as we watch for the May revise and those budget discussions happening in the legislature. So now I'm going to turn to SB 375 related discussions. First, just a quick reminder on what SB 375 is. It was a law that integrated land use and climate mitigation to our regional planning process. So we now develop a sustainable communities strategy with our long range transportation plan. And the California Air Resources Board sets greenhouse gas emission reduction targets for all the regions, but it has lacked significant implementation or funding provisions in it. And so there's um, been a few reports that have come out recently talking about those. There's AB 285, which was a Friedman bill that requires the Strategic Growth Council to assess state and regional transportation planning and funding. And then Senate Bill 150 that, um, from Allen that requires the California Air Resources Board to assess 375 implementation related to housing, land use, and transportation. The big takeaway from both of these is that we're not on track to meet our greenhouse gas reduction targets, as well as some other statewide goals around equity, safety, economy, and environment. And the state acknowledges it hasn't done enough to help with implementation of the regional plans, but both reports also point to regions needing to do more. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the recommendations out of those reports and then discuss some of the related uh, legislation and our advocacy efforts. First on SB 150, that requires CARB to uh, do a report every four years to discuss progress on SB 375 implementation. Um, the report uses data supported metrics to assess the progress of transportation, housing, and land use strategies, identify best practices and challenges to achieving greater reductions, and the impact of state policies and funding on that. The first report came out in 2018, and the second one is due this year. From the first report, here are some, a summary on this slide of some of the recommendations. If you're wanting to uh, read the full recommendations, they, there are links in your staff report to those, but they touch on a need to improve the way the state is targeting incentive funds and improve those incentives to provide affordable housing choices near jobs and transit and high opportunity locations. You can see um, there is an explicit recommendation at the bottom to actually update SB 375 and um, to better connect the state climate, transportation, health equity, all these goals with regional and local planning to improve implementation. And then the 285 report, that first report just came out earlier this year, a few months ago, and it looks at the California transportation plan as well as all of the sustainable community strategies and how these plans will affect the statewide integrated multimodal transportation system 
and reviews the potential impacts and opportunities for coordination of um, state funding programs and recommendations to better align those funding programs with the long-term common goals that we have around environment equity economy. SGC hired the University of California Institute for Transportation Studies to produce five working papers that assess aspects of our transportation plans and funding systems that either advance our goals or um, move us away from those goals related to VMT reduction and emission reduction in particular. And those five papers are on institutional structure, state plans, regional plans, funding programs, and legal issues. So some of the key findings I've tried to summarize here, again, encourage you if you're interested in a deeper dive or um, I'm happy to dig into these later if you wanna go back to the slide, but some similar highlights as 150 that there's a need for the state to review and align its goals and where there might be a conflict with priority goals, seek ways to resolve those conflicts and harmonize it with the policies and actions and then align the funding programs um, to go after those priority goals. There's also some recommendations around the role of MPOs and um, redesigning the California Transportation Plan to have a better impact on implementing our goals. And I did wanna note that CalCOG and um, other MPOs have pointed out some of the shortcomings that the report has where the evaluation focused on the transportation improvement plan and, and just the projects that are funding out of that, but that leaves out a lot of uh, transit, bike and pedestrian housing projects that aren't part of that and that come from different funding sources. And there's also some findings out of it, out of the 285 report that talk about regions not doing enough to implement and align with the California transportation plan, but that document is an aspirational one where ours are fiscally constrained. So we can only include in our um, long range plans what we can reasonably uh, estimate that we'll be able to be funded. But these shortcomings aside, the state has identified a meaningful divergence between near-term investments and urgent climate and equity priorities and flags the lack of housing production at all income levels in climate efficient places that's contributing to a rise in emissions to which we point back to our request for the infill infrastructure grant program, that's exactly what we've, we've been advocating for is that we need to align that housing in those low VMT areas. So we did submit a, a comment letter to SGC on the report, but focused really on how we move forward, make sure that we're part of the ongoing discussions and the MPO should be very involved in partnering with the state to improve our implementation efforts, that we do need to harmonize the state planning with um, goals that might conflict and seek alignment with actions that support MTP SCS implementation at the regional level. We also uh, commented that to implement the S MTP SCS strategies more effectively, MPOs need increased funding and appropriate implementation tools. And that the state should also take a more holistic look that expands beyond the Metropolitan Transportation Improvement Program, which is just one programming document to really cover a wide range of all the funding that's spent on transportation and land use investments. On, um, SB 375 legislation, just wanted to recap briefly that there were three bills last year that would have made changes to SB 375, the SCS development process. None of those um, became law. 
And the same um, authors have put forward some new bills this year. So there are two from Friedman's office that are really tied to this 285 report discussion that are looking to align funding with, um, with our goals of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And so AB 2237 is focused at the MPO regional level and the funding programs there. Again, kind of it currently focuses on the metropolitan on the on the tip. Um, and then AB 240 2438 is looking at the state funding sources and wanting to prioritize uh, projects from state funds and look at the guidelines for those funding programs. And then the um, Allen Cortese bill, they've come together to put out a bill 1217 that seeks to streamline the SCS development process. And um, both author and committee staff of all these bills have really been wanting to hear from regions about what's working and not working. So there's lots of ongoing discussion and we'll, we'll be continuing to engage on that. And we think there will be even more um, discussion as the SB 150 report comes out later this year. In those discussions, we've been really trying to get the staff to focus on implementation of 375. It might make sense to make changes to SB 375, but it should be with a focus on accelerating implementation. And so we've been talking about the uh, what we're calling the eight Ps, um, planning, projects, places, phasing, pricing, pilot projects, and progress reporting. And the state could be uh, doing things in all of these buckets from providing incentives for achieving higher VMT reductions, like more CEQA streamlining options for SCS consistency, aligning state funding to support regionally identified priority projects, removing regulatory barriers for those priority projects on places. It's really, again, what we've been asking for with our Green Means Go advocacy and this more recent infill infrastructure grant budget request that we need to prioritize development in low VMT areas and we need funding that supports investment at the early stages to prepare a corridor or area for infill. And uh, other, you know, a lot of it is about providing funding support to help with regional phasing analysis or pricing pilots, um, pilots that could be funded in the next two to three years, and then evaluating those and helping us move forward what shows to be most effective in reducing VMT and reporting on that progress along the way about what's working with the 375 tools, what CEQA streamlining or funding incentives rise to the top. So that was a lot of information that I just threw at you. <laughs> I'd like to see if you have questions, you want to go back to any of those slides, but the big takeaway here is that there's going to be continued discussion here that, and we're really focusing on these messages around needing to implement our plans, not necessarily change a lot about the process. We feel like we've put together some strong plans and we know where we need to invest in our region to get the land uses that we need to reduce VMT. But we're going to need help from the state, both on the funding side, but also aligning what are sometimes conflicting goals at the state level and get their funding programs to then align with those. Questions, comments, or did I just give you too much. <laughs> I mean, wow. Let's start there. Um, I appreciate the alliteration of your implementation priorities that all start with a P. 
Um, but is the is ultimately the the couple of reports that you identified at the start don't they just point out maybe directly or indirectly that unless we do some dramatic changes to what the cost of driving is we're not going to get to where we want to get to assuming we all want to get there that is absolutely one of the most cost effective ways that we can get at behavior change and also probably one of the more politically challenging right so i think that it, it does definitely point to that yeah because i mean when you boil this all out what you've got is an extremely complex overlapping set of statutes and programs around transportation and housing planning and just you know sort of land use planning that were built for something else and we're trying to tinker by pulling a whole bunch of different levers at the same time when unless we can get people to live right next to all the places that they want to go to they're going to keep driving around here because lousy can i <clears throat> Can I offer a thought about that? Because um, yeah, I, I didn't mean to make this probably the right word for, yeah. for a lot of that. Certainly, I didn't no, mean I, to but, make this sound bleak. I'm just uh, well, there's trying a, to be there's, realistic. I I I, I understand. <clears throat> um, you know, when when I um, I was I was asked to go testify in front of the uh, what they call the tri agency meeting of the Air Resources Board, the California Transportation Commission, and the Department of Housing and Community Development. And I brought with me uh, I could have brought a lot of our jurisdictions, but I brought with me the city of Marysville. And my point was, if we can't make Marysville succeed in their economic revitalization and efforts to build more housing for all the jobs that are at Beale and uh, Dignity Health and Caltrans District 3, then we, we're not gonna succeed at all. And the important part about that, and this kind of gets the heart of Green Means Go and why this does seem like an intractable kind of insolvable problem, but I, I don't think it is. Um, you know, up in Yuba City and Marysville, it's, um, I mean, we've got Yuba Center Transit. It actually provides a really important service for the people that use it. But also we've got very short trips. We've got a lot of things within Yuba City and Marysville that are actually right there. And it's not that everybody takes transit or walks or has given up their car. It's actually that they're almost a complete community that sort of exists. Um, and when you put them to, the two of them together, and so you get lower vehicle miles traveled, right? You get, you get less greenhouse gas emissions. And I think our, 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 and in a nutshell, what we're saying to the state is you have all these criteria and these rules that you don't even see Marysville. It's invisible to you. But if we can help Marysville be successful, we are on our way to actually achieving state, state goals on our local terms, right? That's, that's the whole point of Green Means Go. And, and while it seems daunting, um, to try to figure out how to get our arms around vehicle miles traveled and traffic and, and, and traffic demand. As we talked about earlier in the mega region working group, you know, um, there's multiple reasons to do that. And even in Green Means Go, so much of our climate strategy is a housing strategy, housing in the right places um, and, more, and more housing choices. All of that is compatible with your general plans, <laughs> all of that. And so you all locally have said, Here's the kind of infill and development we want to see. Now the green zones, you've adopted 23, 24 jurisdictions, right? People have put their hands up. And our point to the state is, if we're going to succeed, we have to help our jurisdictions with their hands up, right? So I'm just trying to give you a little bit of hope <laughs> on this. And also to remind all of you that this is, a, this is a land use and housing strategy as much as it's a transportation strategy. Okay. I see a tiny sliver of hope. <laughs> um, directors, any questions or comments for Sabrina? Director Thomas, how do we get everybody that lives in Placerville to just do everything in Placerville and never drive to Sacramento or yeah. only do so on public transportation? 
I think Placerville is an easier ask than some of the other parts of El Dorado <laughs> County that are much more spread out, which are most of our other communities. And believe me, my head is just spinning with the information and the complexities that both, both you and James articulated. So unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you right now, <laughs> Jared Kozlowski. Uh, yeah, no, that was rhetorical <laughs> more than anything. <laughs> <laughs> Any, any other comments or questions? Sabrina, good work uh, summarizing this. Thank you very much. It's an extraordinarily complex issue and it's the primary one that we deal with here at SACOG all the time. So it's good to revisit it and uh, understand its uh, form and, and great challenge. My pleasure, thank you. Okay, terrific, why don't we uh, move on to our next item? Okay, we're on item eight, the cap to cap tour debrief. I believe this is an opportunity for the directors that have been to cap to cap to brief the committee on. So I was very busy coaching the high school track team at Vista Del Lago High School in Folsom over the last week. So I, I was not able to join cap to cap. Anybody like to comment or James give us a summary of? Uh, well, I'll, I'll jump experience. in here before James can give a complete summary. But um, first of all, um, it was absolutely delightful to be together um, as my fellow SAGOG board members. Many of you, I, I you know, were, were there and just really appreciated the opportunity to connect with you off of Zoom in the field regarding transportation and housing and all of the complexities that we just heard about from Sabrina and really enjoyed being with each and every one of you. Appreciate the coordination of our SAGOG staff. Oh my goodness, that was such a great tour from, you know, the bus in the morning to it was a very complete tour. The speakers were amazing. Being able to go to different sites that have done infill, that have done economic development, that have handled complex transportation challenges and gone after huge pots of money to make these feasible. Um, and then to meet with the local leaders, whether they were fellow you know, boards of supervisors or mayors or building professionals, and to you know, speak about that kind of holistic development in the site was just incredibly meaningful. And it was an eye-opening tour. I think what was um, really hit home for me that as a local elected, we are called to be um, proactive. We're called to be visionaries. Um, we're called to be bold. And we're called to think outside of the box, which is what all of these um, housing developments in Virginia showed us whether it was a really creative brand new fire station with housing units above it. I mean, how cool is that? That looked like the character of the historic community that it was, that was just revolutionary. Now, we didn't quite get into how the residents feel about the fire sirens, but you know, I'm sure they worked their way around that. Or whether it was the mosaic project that really incorporated um, amenities like creative outdoor living, oops, oh, sorry, outdoor living spaces and places to gather and connect and, and work and live at the same place in spaces that were flexible and creative um, just blew my mind. And um, just really taken by the thought that as local leaders, we must, we can't look at transportation and land use and economic development in a vacuum, which as items come before our boards, we're often called to do and make um, decisions in silos, that it takes really, everything is integrated, everything is holistic. And the more we bring that lens to our local decisions and kind of force that, uh, you know, force that position a little bit uh, in working with our staff to also think creatively and holistically, uh, the, the better policies we're going to be have for our respective communities and for the region as a whole. So um, just a lot of food for thought that I continue to, um, you know, to, to uh, just really revel in. And tomorrow there's an item coming before our board on an, an affordable housing ordinance, which is quite timely. And believe me, I'm, my mind is all a flutter as to where I need to go with that. So just... Thank you for providing the opportunities to expand our mind and to think um, boldly and creatively for our own jurisdictions as well as regionally. That's fantastic. 
Any others like to comment on Cap to Cap? Lucas, maybe? Wendy, Wendy pretty much said it all, I think. Uh, <laughs> I would say this, though. I mean, the, the consistent sort of high caliber um, tours that are have been set pre Captain Cap tours have been set up by SACOG over the past several years, obviously pre pandemic as well, have really been stellar. I think that there is a lot for us to learn from the sort of DC, the Metro DC suburbs. Um, and I think a lot of it really does apply to, to our region as well and can be in some of these tools uh, and tactics can be employed here. Um, and I think, um, you know, I really that, I want to specifically add that to my voice to that comment that meant Wendy made about the fire station at Alexandria. You know, it was uh, it was a, a new new fire city fire station, but with affordable housing above it. I mean, you know, and work in working with an affordable housing nonprofit developer, and just that one alone is worth us having a further discussion at the board level. I mean, I think that is exactly the type of thing that we should be doing in our communities. I mean, those that want to do it. And I mean, if we can, you know, be in touch with the city of Alexandria and, and, or the nonprofit affordable housing developer that did that, like, I think that would be, I think a lot of folks on the board would be really interested in hearing uh, just about that specific um, infill project alone uh, among all the other great things that we heard and saw. So appreciate again, all the, all the work by SACOG staff to uh, make such a fantastic, um, fantastic day for us all. Outstanding. Anyone else? James, would you like the last word? Always. Um, <laughs> now, I, I look. I want to connect this back to the the previous um, discussion and the and the points you raised, Chair Kozlowski. And I, I'm again, I'm not I'm not trying to say that these these things aren't daunting. We think about you know regional greenhouse gas targets and the future growth of the region. Um, but I, but, I, but I wonder, having been a resident of the district both in the 1990s and the 2010s, um, and knowing the Virginia suburbs and knowing a lot of the people who were in office and, and working out there, um, if you had asked the Virginia suburbs back in the 1990s if they could imagine communities where you didn't have to drive into the district, where you could have all your services, where you, your, your kids and your grandkids could afford to stay there. And I'm not saying it's perfect, right? It is, there is no panacea, there's no... But it is a remarkable transformation. And it is one that gives me that hope and inspiration, the very genuine hope for, for, for us. And I think the other thing that I heard a lot and learned through a lot of these tours, but it really was brought back last Friday, is to have a vision. I mean, I mean, Director Thomas, you just said it so well, right? Have a vision, exercise leadership, and say, I want, I want five of those, or I want this in my community. Because I guarantee you, people in Northern Virginia were told 10, 20, 30 years ago, no, nope, not going to work. It's not going to pencil. There's no market for it, right? And that is true some of the time, but you also have to kind of, you know, your job is to think on the horizon right? and to push the envelope and to be adamant about what you want, to set those standards high, right? And that's where we come in to try to help you in support and to not settle. Um, so I, 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 I take a lot of inspiration from those DC suburbs, and I think there's a lot to learn um, from them and to be inspired by. And um, final thing, just um, mark your calendars. The next trip, Salt Lake City, June 23rd, 24th. We're happy to be there. It's uh, out and back one night. Uh, we're being hosted by our sister agency out there, the Wasatch Front Regional Commission. Uh, they're very excited to have you. And so um, more to come on that. James, your your uh, audio broke up there for just a second. Could you repeat the date? Uh, I'm taking my video off. June 23rd and 24th is the Thursday, Friday, out and back one night. Um, yeah, uh, more more details to come to RSVP, but it's the uh, uh, the Thursday, Friday, June 23rd and 24th. Excellent. Okay. Um, all right. Well, that brings us to the end of our agenda. Um, James, any general words of wisdom or comments from anybody before we close? I think we... Given you all I have. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Very good. Well, listen, our, uh, our next committee meeting will be on Monday, June 6th, 2022, here at 10 a.m. Um, in this boardroom and virtually as we have done today. Um, so thank you all very much for your participation today. I look forward to seeing you at the full board meeting. And for today, we are adjourned. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. you.